Please be seated. Grace to you and peace in the name of God who creates us, who redeems, and who comforts. I'm Kathy Boyd. It's my great privilege on behalf of Scott and Christy and their family to bid you a warm Austin welcome on this beautiful day and to this memorial celebration. Today is a celebration of the life of a most extraordinary woman, Mary Elizabeth Sutherland Carpenter. Now, I feel sure that you've never considered this, but Liz Carpenter and the Apostle Paul had several things in common, <laughs> not the least of which is that they were both writers. Paul wrote, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life. Liz wrote, God knows I deserve heaven. <laughs> I invite you to join me in a brief moment of silence and a prayer as we become present to the presence of God in this place. Let us pray. I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though she die. And everyone who has life and has committed herself to me in faith shall not die forever. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Amen.
A reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it too will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child, and when I became an adult, I put an end to childish things. For now, as we see through a glass, darkly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these three is love. Liz liked to tell of the answer Eleanor Roosevelt gave whenever anyone asked where the president was. Wherever the laughter is, she would say. <clears throat> Liz might well have been talking about herself. She created laughter, inspired it, and absorbed it, and it followed just about every observation she ever made. About Republicans, she said she met her first one when she was 17, and it was a terrifying experience. <laughs> She said the hot tub in her yard would accommodate six friends or four enemies. <laughs> her book, Getting Better All the Time, was a delightful account of the joys of growing older. But a year after it was published, she threatened to write a sequel with the title, I Lied. <laughs> Even as she contemplated her death, she did so with her irrepressible wit. She told her friends to come to Salado and help scatter her ashes. But she said, keep your mouths closed. <laughs> Some of Liz's humor was famously ribald. Back in the early 80s, she read a magazine story about the relaxed morals of the younger generation. I was born too soon to get in on that, she told me. <laughs> 
But she said she was going to write an article about it, and she had the title already, I Was Screwed by the Sex Revolution. <laughs> At the time of the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal, she confessed, that she confessed that she was perplexed. She didn't know, she said, whether it was oval sex in the oral office or oral sex in the oval <laughs> office. Liz not only exuded humor, she inspired it, too. And the stories told about her have become legend. Many of them involve her well-known discomfort in the air and the discomfort she inflicted on her fellow passengers. <laughs> she was alone once on a bumpy flight, and no friend's arm was available. So she used the stranger sitting next to her to express her nervousness, gouging, squeezing, and pummeling him. When they landed, the man said to her, lady, I don't know who you are, and you don't know who I am, but it's a good thing we're not going any further because if we did, we'd have to get married. <laughs> a group of friends were the only passengers on a small plane traveling from Austin to Houston for the dedication of the Johnson Space Center. The flight was providing more bumps than Liz wanted. She told Haywood Smith, one of President Johnson's military aides, to go tell those pilots to stop jockeying around. They're doing all this on purpose, she said. <laughs> Haywood, something of a wag himself, went to the cockpit, looked in, closed the door, and looked back at Liz. There's no one there, he said. <laughs> She not only found humor, she took it wherever she could. Comedian Mark Russell stopped in the middle of one of his spiels at the Washington Hilton one evening and looked at Liz as she was scribbling away, shamelessly taking down all of his gags. Am I going too fast for you, he asked. <laughs> Meeting an historian whose field was colonial America, and she, America, she demanded, tell me something funny about the Puritans. Well, concentrating on Liz as the queen of mirth might seem to obscure, obscure the Liz that history knows and honors, the champion of noble causes, the pioneer for the full citizenship of women, the eloquent and dedicated voice of liberalism. But the laughing Liz is as imperishable an image as is that of the valiant crusader, and Liz knew that. She gave me specific instructions to follow when she knew I was going to speak about her on this occasion. Try, she said, to be funny. <laughs> That's a daunting challenge under any circumstances given by Liz Carpenter, but it's particularly daunting when it's given to someone whose qualifications as a comic she was not all that fond of anyway. <laughs> Every afternoon, in the White House, she assembled a collection of wits from around the administration to meet in her office and discuss the president's speech schedule for the coming week and try to inject some humor into those speeches. She invited me to join the group, but not for any contribution I might make. You're not very funny, she said, but you can pour the whiskey. Well, that was all Liz, all of it Liz. But most important of all for me, there was the cherished friend of so many years. She was an essential part of my life, as she was in so many lives. All who were blessed with her friendship will talk about her, remember, think about her, and, and tell these old stories over and over as long as the last one of us lives. Her code name in the White House given to her by the Secret Service was springtime. She died on the first day of spring. I have no doubt that Liz would have been pleased at that confluence of timing and title, but I can't help thinking too 
that there's something in there that Liz Carpenter would have laughed about. Sonnet for a Sister, for Liz, by Thomas Shelton Sutherland IV, 1986. Our sister's house sits high against a hill. We all go there for peculiar reasons, tea or sympathy or what you will. Our sister is a woman for all seasons. Poetry and politics, progress for the good, old hymns and laughter fill the gentle air. For all around there grows a grassy wood. From it, the timid and small creatures stare. You ask, what brings this company so various? Far views, gay flowers, the garden, bath or table? We answer. God made us lonely and gregarious, and merciful, he added worth when able. Bird, beast, woman, man, or mouse, come up to see the lady of the house. Modern Frontier Woman, for and about Liz Carpenter, by Geraldine Buckley. She's a modern frontier woman, roots deeply in the soil of the Texas that her ancestors developed their toil. She learned love of life and laughter while dawdling at their knees, absorbing generosity and courage with great ease. She's determined as a covered wagon rolling over the plain. Thus her fearlessness in the face of danger is easy to explain. Her love of music, hymns, and poetry stems from the eaves when all the folks would gather for a concert neath the trees. Like them, she gives a helping hand to anyone in need. Whether family or strangers, she'll help them to succeed. Her wicked wit and humor were learnt when times were tough. But dangers weren't so bad if you could laugh enough. She's a modern frontier woman battling different kinds of ills. She too has conquered territory, developed brand new skills. For the spirit of old Salado still courses through her soul and imbues her with the qualities of pioneers of old. Well, Liz would be so relieved to see that there are this many Democrats still in Texas. <laughs> I'm Bonnie Pazell, and in 1978, I was blessed when Scott, Liz's son, married Jean, my mother. The wedding took place on a blustery March 3rd in a gazebo near Lake Austin, and in attendance were Jean and Scott, me, a justice of the peace, Liz, and a duck. Yes, a duck. I should have known then that life with Liz was not going to be a standard affair. It was going to be filled with strange guests, amazing characters, and memorable events. Liz never referred to me as her step-granddaughter. From the get-go, she always introduced me as her granddaughter. And when she wanted me to present myself to someone across the room, she would say, 
Go and introduce yourself and tell them that you are Liz Carpenter's granddaughter. <laughs> I found out that people were always impressed when I did that. And I got to hear great compliments about Liz. Occasionally, someone would mention the family resemblance, how much I looked like Liz. <laughs> In fact, wherever Liz went, admirers were quick to follow. And she used her bully pul pulpit well. In 1980, in the 1980s, my mom ran for Bellevue City Council against a very popular incumbent, a Republican incumbent. Liz happened to come up for a visit during the campaign. <laughs> Naturally, the local newspaper, uh, there were still local newspapers back then, wanted to do a feature piece on her. She graciously agreed. A few days later, there was a long piece about Liz, her life, and her Washington State family. There was also a very large photo of her. She looked great with a giant Jean Carpenter for City Council <laughs> button proudly on her chest. My mom won in a landslide. <laughs> my great grandmother, my grandmother, the press secretary who knew how to get great free press. Liz opened new worlds to me, filled my life with life-changing and life-affirming opportunities. As a young, wide-eyed girl, I got to spend a Christmas in New York, just blocks off of the dazzling Rockefeller Center. As an ide idealistic co-ed, I was able to meet some of my feminist icons. I went to a Valentine's Day party with Gloria Steinem. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> For a summer, I lived with, UT, with Liz while attending UT. Hook em. One day, I came home from my movie theater job dressed in polyester, <laughs> smelling of popcorn and butter, and I could hear chatter in the dining room. Liz was hosting an improp impromptu dinner party again. I tried to sneak by, but Liz bellowed, Bonnie, is that you? Come in here and have some dinner. So I ditched my fake bow tie and vest and then sat down at a very full table. Among other notables, right across the table from me was Lady Bird Johnson. I spent that evening taking in the insights and stories and laughter of some of the most influential people. And at the head of the table was Liz. I need to close, but I want to share one more personal memory. About three or four years ago, I was in Austin for business, but I had an afternoon free and I, I went to spend it with Liz. It wasn't a bad day for her, but it wasn't the greatest, and she preferred to stay in bed. We talked for a little while, and when talking ran out, we pulled out season one of Seinfeld. <laughs> Liz, you know, everyone knows, loved to laugh, and she loved Seinfeld. We sat in her bed and watched all the episodes, laughing, crying because we were laughing, and occasionally drifting in and out of sleep. It's a simple private memory, but it's my favorite memory. Liz transformed my life. She graciously led me into a whole nother wonderland. I know my world will be smaller without her, and I suspect that without her wit, charm, and humor, everybody else's world will be a bit smaller as well. Prayer of St. Francis, 
Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, not to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. You know, it's true, 
Liz did absolutely love music and song. You know, I'll never forget what it was like when I was a child, and I'd pick up the phone, and I would hear my grandmother's voice singing to me, Hey there, you with the stars in your eyes. You know, it was one of the two songs that Liz would sing to me almost every time we talked, actually. And I, I do have to admit, though, that I use the word sing here a little loosely. <laughs> most of us who, most people who knew my grandma and all of us who loved her knew that she had a very unique relationship with pitch. <laughs> it was an open marriage. You know, it's been said that we can tell that God loves those who sing out of key the most because he makes them sing so loudly. <laughs> and I don't think anyone has ever done so much to prove that statement true as my grandmother. <laughs> Off key, maybe. Loud, sure. Beloved, unquestionably. And good for her, you know, she lived her life like she had a song in her soul and nothing, and I mean nothing, would stop it from coming out. A song of liberation, a song of loyalty, a song of caring, a love song to family, friends, the country, the Democratic Party, and the great state of Texas. Nothing could stop her, not keys or conventions, not expectations or exasperations. When Liz, when Liz put her mind to something, she was an unstoppable force for good. And this is the Liz that the whole world came to know. But of course, I had the unique pleasure of seeing her from a different angle, too. You know, to me, she was still the political heavyweight and author and humorist. But more than that, she was my grandma. She was the white-haired old lady who would kiss me on the top of my head while we watched the sun rise over, o over Austin, killing time for um, the Saturday morning cartoons to come on. <laughs> she was the one who taught me what kind of feed you need to put out if you want to have a peek at a deer wandering by your yard. She was the one who taught me to be quick on my feet because she would drive her scooter all around the house. <laughs> And she could not abide it being set any lower than the fastest setting possible. She could corner that thing like it was a Ferrari. <laughs> and she would plan these elaborate family vac vacations just so that we could come and be together and spend time together. You know, she was my grandma and she loved me the way that only a grandmother can. And I think I didn't even fully realize until this week how wonderful and how humbling it is that a woman with a life like Liz's is proud of you. And just thinking about that, my ears begin to ring with the sound of the other song that she would always sing to me, or at least the first part, about, part of it. I can still sort of hear her singing. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And my heart just wants to sing right back to her. You'll never know, dear, how much I loved you. Please don't take my sunshine away. I love you, Grandma. Thank you. A reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long.
My friends, we gather here for Liz Carpenter. Liz Carpenter wanted us to remember her. How could we forget her? <laughs> she wanted us to laugh for her, and Harry Middleton has led the way. And she wanted us to cry for her. This is what she said in her book, Getting Better All the Time. I want low Methodist with hymns you sing and go away whistling. I want the church full. I think she would have been okay with the LBJ Auditorium. <laughs> and I want open sobbing, not just a few wet eyes. <laughs> I have extra Kleenex if you need it. Hold it in a phone booth if everyone I know died first. <laughs> but after all the political meetings I've advanced and pew packed for politicians, presidents to be, and presidents that were, I deserve a good funeral. <clears throat> I want good press and glorious obituaries with some irreverent anecdotes about, about my life. And I want laughter along with the tears. We are here as we've ever been, trying to do as Liz would guide us to do. You see, I think of almost all of you in this auditorium and in the extended audience that is sharing via internet, and I think of us as her family of the heart because truly she loved us and we loved her. We share memories, we share stories, we see the pictures of her. And I think we could say in unison, I miss Liz Carpenter. I wish she could be here. You know, she would love this attention. <laughs> she would adore seeing every one of you and asking you what you've been doing of interest. I wish Bill Moyers could have been here. I'm sure Liz felt the same way. But I was thinking if I were Liz Carpenter, what would I be thinking in my heart? And it came to me that she would be thinking as I am now, thank goodness I get more time. <laughs> Liz was not afraid of dying. In fact, she told me early on, many years ago, to be prepared to speak. I went to so many funerals, taking down notes. She took the humor, I took the lines for crying, and I'll share some in a minute. She held a rehearsal, several I'm told, but one I was at. <laughs> and that was the one at the Paramount Theater here in Austin. It was the one where she stood as an angel on the stage. <laughs> I had tried to get them to find that picture to put up here, but it was not possible. It was the one where she had three gospel choirs in the uh, balcony singing How Great Thou Art while she stood <laughs> on the stage as an angel. Oh, she had a good time that night. <laughs> Yes, Ann Richards was one of the speakers, Lily Tomlin, a host of important people. But for Liz, it was also important because it was the way she raised money. And a lot of you participated in that, to have the Liz Carpenter Lectureship at the University of Texas. She was one of those people who loved investing in the future. And so every time I go to the LBJ, to the Liz Carpenter Lectureship, I think of all the people she's brought and how much that has meant to the education of this university she loved and certainly of the entire community. She loved her children and her grandchildren. She was so proud to be a Robertson. And she wanted to inspire and encourage women. Katie Sherrod is one of the many people from Leadership Texas, Leadership Austin, Leadership America, Leadership anything else you want to describe, who went to her house. Katie described it this way. Liz Carpenter was killer smart, bawdy, irreverent, kind-hearted, generous, and a feminist to the core. Liz Carpenter never did behave the way society thought good girls are supposed to behave. 
and she taught generations of Texas women how to do the same. She was someone who reached out to younger people in many ways. My students always got to go to Liz Carpenter's house, my leadership students, and one of them wrote me this week to say that he would, he always feels that the night he was at Liz Carpenter's house was the outstanding moment of his undergraduate career. She loved interesting conversation. If you call Liz and said, I have food and interesting people, she would say, come have dinner with me. And we did. Almost everyone here can remember a night at Liz Carpenter's. She loved causes and candidates, and she gathered them and entertained them. She had her special friends there. The last time I saw Lady Bird Johnson with Lucy and Linda was at Liz's. I've always admired and respected Lucy and Linda, but I can't tell you how high they are in my estimation now. Because in recent months, they were so faithful to go see Liz, to call Liz. The first time I went to see Liz in this year, they had been there first. We got to know each other as her family of the heart at Liz Carpenter's house. But there was another side to Liz. You know, she did have that hot tub that Harry Middleton described. I used to call her a red hot, hot tub mama. H.C. Carter was one of the people that used to sit there. I talked to H.C. yesterday. He could not be here, but he was telling me stories. Because you see, Liz loved men. And she loved the company of men. And he was telling me a story about how she had some, uh, an invitation to go to something that involved a cruise. And so she asked him if he wanted to go. And he said, well, yeah, that sounded like fun. Um, should he bring a date? And she said, you don't need two dates. <laughs> or when James Michener died, they had reason to be together. And so they, Liz said to him, wouldn't it be nice for us to get together some evening and have some steak and some wine? Just think about the people we've known. And H.C. agreed that'd be fine. And so he left, and the appointed night they had agreed on, he called on the way over just to see if there was anything she needed him to pick up. And her response was one some of you would be guessing. She said, sure. Would you bring two steaks and some wine? <laughs> Liz did hate to fly. Um, I heard the same story Harry just gave you, only it was Jake Pickle who was talking and who went up to check the um, front part of the plane. But I saw her use that. Uh, I'd be with her getting ready to get on a plane when she was still flying, and I would watch her, and she would pick out the most distinguished elderly, not elderly, uh, older gentleman. And she would go over and she would say, you know, I just hate flying. I know it's going to be terrible. I think I could make it if I could just sit by you and hold your hand. <laughs> it worked. And we are the community that she built around her house, around her personality, and around her causes. Some of those causes were obviously political. Molly Ivins had some great ones that she would repeat. For example, Molly used to tell the story that when John Connolly signed up for Texans for Nixon in 72, that Liz said, thank God he wasn't at the Alamo. He would have led Texans for Santa Ana. <laughs> there was a time when Liz, who'd been through breast cancer once, had it again. Molly and I were both in that group of people. And so we did a lot of things to raise money for the Breast Cancer Resource Center and related breast cancer groups. One of the best lines Liz always used, so I never could, was, I've always heard a tit for a tat. <laughs> I gave up the tit. What's a tat and when do I get it? <laughs> Thank you.
There was a plane once from Dallas to Austin. On it were Cactus and Peggy Pryor, Molly Ivins, Ann Richards, and when Molly got off the plane, they were laughing. They had entertained the entire plane, the entire 27 minutes from Dallas to Austin, and Molly said, if that plane had gone down, there wouldn't be a single left laugh line left in Texas. <laughs> and she was right. In 1977, Liz and I decided we wanted to be a part of the Headliners Club. Now, that was partly because they said we couldn't. <laughs> Headliners was a male-only club. And so we had to find somebody in that club who would be our champion. Cactus Pryor agreed to be our champion. Not every man in that club was happy about it, but it led to us getting in after the headline in the local paper that said, Women Storm the Headliners Club. <laughs> and a reporter said to Liz, well, how soon do you think you need to be included? And she said, tomorrow is too late. <laughs> Liz always wanted to be seen in a positive light. On one occasion, she went to a doctor because she was having real trouble with her ankle. And so he visited with her, he examined the, article, the ankle, and finally he started dictating. You've all seen doctors do this. Um, I'm going to say it in a, I'm not going to use every proper medical term, but this is what I wrote down. Mrs. Carpenter, he dictated, is obese with boggy synovium in the left ankle. Films show degenerative changes involving the left ankle with joint space narrowing and hypertrophic changes. For God's sake, Liz said, is that all you're gonna put down? And he said, well, what do you want? And she said, well, can't you say I'm a sexy, dynamic woman? <laughs> and so he picked up the microphone. Mrs. Carpenter says she is a sexy, dynamic woman. <laughs> There are so many stories we could tell. Liz wanted great press. Bonnie was so right about that. And she timed her death for a day when there was nothing for the press to cover. <laughs> Congress was debating the health care bill, but it had gotten monotonous at that point. And so there was press for Liz, and I know she loved it. Check coverage. She wanted us to laugh. Harry Middleton led the way. Check. And she wanted us to cry for her and what we have lost. It's not crying because she, I'm sure, is with friends. It's crying for ourselves in a way because of what we don't have. Her, her enthusiasm, her wit, her dedication, all of her commitments. My favorite line from going to all those funerals was, quote, death ends a life, not a relationship. And that is so true. We have not lost the relationship we have with her or with each other. We think of her as the queen of the hill at 116 Skyline Drive because she brought us together. She led us in helping politicians and causes. She showed us a way she wanted us to go. There are so many people I wish I could remember and you can't talk about everybody. But there was a quote I wanted to share. It says, the people who make a difference in our lives are not just the ones with the credentials, the most money or the most awards. They are the ones that care for us. And Liz was able to stay in her home three years until the very beginning of this year because of three sisters who cared for her. Rose Johns, who's with us, and I would describe her. She's tall, she's elegant, she's wearing all off-white with a hat. But Rose, would you stand? Liz would want to say thank you. She would want us to do a few things. She'd want us to help Democrats. 
Um, Anita Davis and I went out just right after the elections and she was already planning what we were gonna do next. I think if she heard Texas had elected a statewide Democrat in November, there would indeed be rejoicing in heaven. <laughs> she would want <laughs> she would want us to support women's issues. Um, Cecile Richards, you know Ann Richards was her mother, who is now the head of Planned Parenthood, was here to tape a thing with Evan Smith, but she's here on the front row for this very important event. And she would want us to help form a new generation of strong, gutsy women who know humor. I am humor challenged, but <laughs> she would want us to try. When I think about this Women's History Month, I think about the history she's been part of. In my mind, I see a pantheon of strong Texas women up above. Because I don't just grieve for Liz and missing her. I grieve for Barbara Jordan and Ann Richards and Lady Bird Johnson and Molly Ivins. And I can see them all together having such a good time. There is a poem that relates death to a ship. And it says that when somebody you care for dies, it is like a ship leaving the port. We can no longer see the ship, but it exists, just not in our world, in another realm. You can just see those women with Les Carpenter, her husband, waving for her to come as she left the world we can see. I see Lady Bird and Liz on a bench, looking at the wildflowers. You know, it's a perfect year for wildflowers. It was cool, it was wet, and they are already out, and they're going to be even more glamorous. And so I think of Lady Bird and Liz on that bench, telling stories, looking down, judging us as we speak, <laughs> doing critiques, and looking at the world they've created for us. Liz, we love you today, and we will love you always. Thanks for letting us be part of your family of the heart. Thank you. You know, Cactus Pryor once said that Liz puts you in some high cotton, but she expects you to chop. So, and I know everyone here has been given a specific job to do today. She, my job came when we were driving up to Dallas once, and we were in her old blue Crown Victoria. And she said, now, Paula, you set yourself and lead every lap with a big belly guffaw, and then wipe every tear. Well, today, thanks to Christy and Scott, I also had the pleasure to read one of her favorite poems. It's called Warning by Jenny Joseph, but you probably know it by the first line. When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say, we've no money for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick the flowers in other people's garden and learn to spit. You can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go or only bread and pickle for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. And now, though, we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I am old and start to wear purple. Liz is 
niece, Cindy. You may be able to see the family resemblance. I don't know. <laughs> You're all going to help me with this part of the program. If you can pull out a program or look on someone's next to you, uh, you'll be reading the prayer part that is in italics, except don't say silence. <laughs> Will you stand and pray with me if you're able? In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this congregation, the nation, and the world, for all those who for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For all who serve in the armed forces and for an end to war. For the peace of the world, that spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among all people for the peace and the unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for our sister and aunt, cousin, mother, grandmother, who was washed in baptism, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her fellowship with all the saints, Give to all the departed eternal rest. Let life perpetual shine upon them. For the special needs of this congregation, Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Amen. Before I offer my tribute to my mother, we have just a few modifications to the program. Uh, Sarah mentioned Bill Moyers was really sorry he couldn't be with us today. He has a show, as you may know, on Friday evenings on PBS, and he just couldn't finish it in time to get on the last plane last night to be here. But we have two special guests who are going to appear through the wonders of video. The first is a woman who you might say has a rather busy travel schedule, or she would have been her, her in person. She admired my mother very much, and my mother loved Thank you it. for and my, <laughs> and my mother loved and admired her uh, so much that she thought she should be president. I think you'll recognize this woman. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to join you in celebrating the life of my friend, Liz Carpenter. Those of us who were blessed to know Liz, to learn from her, to laugh with her, and of course, to be told what to do by her, have forever lost a piece of ourselves with her passing. And so has our country. Liz Carpenter always liked to charge hell with a bucket of cold water. Well, I'm not sure if Washington fully qualified as hell for her, but for the better half of a century, she took the Capitol by storm, bucket in hand. Indeed, she took on every cause, from winning equal privileges for women reporters, to advising presidents and first ladies, to raising two young nieces and a nephew late in life. She did it all with that 
unrivaled Liz Carpenter energy, passion, commitment to principles, and can-do spirit. And she always did it with a sense of humor. In the Johnson White House, she was not only a trusted strategist, speechwriter, and press secretary, but also, in the words of a former colleague, the vice president in charge of laughter. For those visiting her home just outside Austin, directions were as follows. Turn right on Wildcat Hollow, and before you can say vote Democratic, take a left. <laughs> Dying, she predicted, would mean going to that great Democratic convention in the sky. And I have no doubt that Liz is right up there now, counting delegates, organizing caucuses, issuing orders to a heavenly host of the party faithful. Yes, Liz was a force of nature, an outside personality with courage and spirit as big as the state she was raised in and loved. We will miss that keen wit, that brilliant pen, that sharp tongue, and that huge, huge Texas heart. So Liz, my friend, the world will never be the same without you, but it will always be better because of you and your legacy. May you rest in peace. We love you, we miss you, and every time we think of you, you're gonna bring a smile to our lips, and we're gonna think, what would Liz be saying now? Take care of you. Okay, uh, and our second uh, special speaker is a fellow that I met uh, in front of the U.S. Embassy in London uh, when, at a Vietnam peace demonstration. He had a beard and an Afro haircut, and he just insisted on being part of this celebration of the life of Liz Carpenter as well. Let's roll the videotape. I'm so sorry I can't be with you today as you honor the tremendous life of my friend Liz Carpenter. I first met Liz because Christy and I became friends longer ago than we'd like to remember. She was a true trailblazer, one of a kind. Her life and career opened unlimited doors for women in politics and three presidents, including me, called on her to serve. I was glad to appoint her to serve on the White House Council on Aging and she never seemed to mind admitting that she was eligible to serve. She made a joke about that, as she did so much else in life. And Hillary and I were both honored to speak at her lecture series at the University of Texas. Liz had a boundless spirit and sharp and keen insights. You could see them in her books, her speeches, and in everyday life. In so many ways, she reminded us all that we should find humor, adventure, and purpose in life, wherever we are. She truly was a great American, a great Texan, a wonderful person. I'll miss her a lot, and I know all of you will too. I always knew my mother was special, even as a small child. It was the way that people responded to her. She made them laugh, and they were always so glad to see her. People flocked to her when she came into a room. As I grew up, it became... <laughs> I think that's the wrong photo. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I grew up, I, became, I began increasingly to understand why. Her big, embracing energy, optimism, and sense of fun captivated and infected everybody around her. It was like a bolt of, shine, of sunshine had hit them in the face and they wanted to bask in it. My brothers in my childhood bore little resemblance to the world of Ozzy and Harriet that we would see on television. Calm, predictable, orderly is not how you would have described the Carpenter household located in Washington, D.C. Ours was a family life punctuated by ringing telephones, whirlwind activity, and ongoing political gossip. My parents created the Carpenter News Bureau before I was born, 
and our lives revolved around their reporting on national political stories to the some 20 newspapers that they represented, mostly from the Southwest. My parents were truly a team in every sense of the word. Liz and Les, that's how everyone knew them. They were full and equal partners in an era when that was very rare. They shared everything, including a love that was very, very deep. They were drawn to one another at Austin High School when they worked together on the Maroon, the school newspaper. They went on to the University of Texas, where they studied journalism, wrote for the Daily Texan, and became sweethearts. Being highly creative types, they even wrote a musical, together, a musical comedy together at UT called Time Marches On. These were people who wanted to be at the center of the action. And where better to launch their careers than Washington, DC? So that's where my mother headed right after graduation, and my father joined her right after he finished his service in the Navy. Just a little more than a year after graduation, my father wrote a letter to my mother's mother asking for her blessing on their engagement. A passage from that letter captures so well the enduring partnership that had been formed. My father wrote, so trite and so ancient is the expression made for each other, but I feel it has a lot of meaning to it when there is somebody that is so much of what you have always wanted that you can't endure the loneliness of being away from her, that you think of every little daily occurrence in terms of her, that all of your time is spent dreaming of a future which has a scope of enchantment that gives you such a desire to live. Mary Elizabeth and I are so much more than two young sweethearts. We're companions, good friends, our love is one that developed from two people who like the same things, the same people, have the same ambitions, the same philosophy for living. We have a complete understanding of one another. So much, we have shared so much in the past, we know each other so well. To me, there could be no better combination. To me, there is no better definition of what love is what two people planning marriage should be, unquote. As time marched on, they loved writing together, planning parties together, sharing seats in the Capitol Gallery, swapping stories, laying in bed in the morning and reading the newspapers together, gardening together, sitting by the fire on Sundays. You name it, it was usually together, Liz and Les. They were social animals. And that's part of what made them so successful. They loved to entertain in our modest house on Woodway Lane, which was nestled between dogwood trees, azaleas, and, rose, and the rose beds my father so carefully tended. Lyndon Johnson, Sam Rayburn, Al Gore, Al Gore Sr., and lots and lots of Texas congressmen and lobbyists and cabinet members, fellow reporters, would crowd into our small living room the cocktails and laughter flowed freely. And sometimes deals were made, like the time Majority Leader Johnson and Attorney General Rogers worked out a compromise on an appropriations bill standing under the apple tree in our backyard at my mother's 39th birthday party. My brother and I were trained from an early age to be co-hosts, to help welcome guests when they arrived, to carry coats upstairs to the bedroom. No shyness was permitted. We were taught to stick out our tiny hands and say our names so guests could hear. Washington was a different town in those days, a small town where Republicans and Democrats were friends and often crossed the aisle to become allies on important issues. A big part of what made that possible was that Washington was a very social town. Republicans and Democrats socialized together constantly. In Washington, information is power. At the end of most days, my parents would dash into our house, quickly change clothes, and head out to a cocktail party or a dinner party full of movers and shakers. This was where they developed sources. And this is where they picked up the stories that they bat out on their manual typewriters the next day in their office at the National Press Building. Life was exhilarating. My brother and I would always get a kick out of going to their office. 
where the sound of teletype machines and the clicking and clacking of typewriters flooded the corridors. And we could read the names of the newspapers that were stenciled on every glass door as we walked down the hall. You could liter literally smell the ink and feel the excitement of hurried people scrambling to meet their deadlines. In those days, reporting was romantic. So much so that later, when I was about 30, I learned from my mother that I had actually been conceived in their office at the National Press Building. <laughs> as she put it, on a slow news day. <laughs> and, and typical of my mother, she didn't share this with me in private, but rather from the dais while roasting Eric Severide at an event honoring him at the National Press Club, <laughs> where I sat drop-jawed in the audience while learning of my colorful origins. To top it off, her remarks were broadcast live on C-SPAN. <laughs> My mom was what, not one to let propriety or inhibitions get in the way of a funny line. Being funny went to the core of her being, and it came completely naturally to her. What a gift. Not only did it endear to the thousands and thousands of people she made laugh throughout her 89 years, it also reflected her passion for life, her craving for fun and a recognition that seeing the funny side was an essential, an essential ingredient for a happy life. And happy it was, for the most part. As we experienced the sadness of her loss, everyone should feel comforted that she had a whale of a good time on this earth. And she did it her way. Which brings me to another quality, earthiness. She was as authentic as the Texas soil, and she took the lessons that she drew from it to the nation's capital, to the White House, to the Shah's palace in Iran, to the mansions of the rich and the mighty. She was the same person in those settings that she was in the shacks of Appalachia, where she traveled with Lady Bird Johnson, or to the shores of Senegal with Vice President Johnson. Princes, paupers, Everyone experienced the very same salt of the earth, Liz. She was totally without pretense, devoid of snobbery, and comfortable in her own skin. From her pioneer forebears, the Sutherlands and the Robertsons, she inherited her guts, her relentless can-do spirit, her, which could sometimes drive you crazy, uh, her compulsion to break down barriers, and her desire, above all, to make things happen. And usually that meant now or in the next five minutes. Patience was never a virtue. She also gained a passionate love of words and of music from her upbringing. Her great-grandmother, Mary Elizabeth Robertson, started the first literary society in Texas in the parlor of the Salado House where my mother was born. Her mother, named Mary Elizabeth, was an avid reader and could recite many, many poems from heart. And her childhood was infused with Methodist hymns. Her family and lots of aunts and uncles and cousins would stand around the piano and sing that old rugged cross, church in the wildwood, love lifted me, and so many others. Anyone who ever attended a Liz Carpenter party, and that probably includes several zillion people, knows that singing was mandatory. Hymns, show tunes, standards echoed off the walls of her Westlake home. She felt singing fed the soul, and her guests never left hungry. She stretched people, really stretched people. As Ann Richards once said, if Liz put you in a boat and said row, by God, you put your oar in the water and rowed. <laughs> like her boss, Lyndon Johnson, she did not believe in idle hands. No standing around was permitted, and no task too big or too small. Whatever needed to get done, figure it out and do it, and you better not complain. Occasionally, speed got in the way of accuracy, like the time she brought the wrong dog home from the veterinarian. <laughs> or went to the gardening store to pick up a small statue of St. Francis to put in our garden. She got home to realize she'd picked up Jesus instead. <laughs> she ran back to the vet to exchange the scrawny dachshund for our precious and plump Mitzi, 
But the mistake with the garden statue, she just couldn't bring herself to correct. And she said, you just can't return Jesus. <laughs> My brother and I were the beneficiaries of the Liz Lessons of Life, and they remain etched in our psyche to this day. In addition to no task too big, no task too small, she always taught us to think big. One Christmas when we were little, she decided we should make Yule logs and presents to take to people. You might figure this meant the next door neighbors or our teachers or other family friends. But no, with my mother overseeing this project, it meant the President of the United States. And it wasn't Lyndon Johnson, it was Dwight Eisenhower, with whom our acquaintance is, as a family, you might say, was rather limited. But that was no barrier. We drove right up to the White House and delivered it to the guard. Joining her list of the deadly sins of shyness and laziness was being boring. After all, she was entertaining, and she thought everybody else should be too. As many of you know, being a guest of Liz Carpenter at a dinner at her place meant you would be called on to answer a provocative question. And it could be anything from what most shaped you to what's the most unusual place you've ever had sex? <laughs> Thankfully, I escaped the latter question by pleading the Fifth Amendment. This dinner rit question ritual, even the ones with the G-rated questions, was tough on her kids, who were required to be, along with her guests, inventive, profound, or witty upon command. As I said, she stretched you. Her tremendous enthusiasm, natural promotional talents, and love of politics made her a natural campaigner. I'm talking about campaigns of the old-fashioned variety, full of rallies and balloons and cheering people. She campaigned for any Democrat, anywhere, anytime, and do just about anything that was asked of her. She even agreed a few years ago to dress up as a yellow dog and ride in the back of a convertible at a parade in Fredericksburg, Texas. Organizing the Lady Bird special whistle stop tour through the South in 1964 was one of her favorite experiences ever. 225 reporters and scores of stops along the way where the First Lady spoke to crowds who were sometimes friendly and not, sometimes not so friendly. But my mother loved every lively, tumultuous second of it. In 1972, she organized a caravan called the Grassroots Grasshopper full of singers and fellow activists that wound its way through the back roads of the Deep South to campaign for George McGovern. My father called it Liz's suicide mission. <laughs> but as you have always already heard, Liz was not to be deterred from anything she set her mind to. Thinking she could win votes for George McGovern in the Deep South, now that's optimism that only somebody with a pioneer heritage could muster. Some of the best times I experienced with my mother were as an adult. We shared a lot of interests and a lot of friends. Our mother-daughter dynamic morphed into a friendship where we'd consult each other. We'd edit each other's speeches and seek out each other's advice on various projects. We also shared a love of politics, and it was a topic of conversation virtually every time we spoke. Twice we served as fellow delegates to the Democratic Convention in 1996 me from California and she from Texas. And we had wonderful times together on vacations in Martha's Vineyard, searching for the Loch Ness Monster, and literally stomping on grapes in the Napa Valley. She was a great friend and always ready to do what I or anyone else asked. In closing, I just want to say that she was the most remarkable woman I've ever known. Earthy, big-hearted, Funny, controlling, creative, charismatic, high octane, generous, irreverent, irresistible, irrepressible, and totally lovable. Truly an American original. My brother and I will miss her.
my God when I eat or some wonder consider I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul. Let us pray. Eternal God, the God of Sarah and Hagar, Esther, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Throughout history, you have worked through women to accomplish your ends. It was women who were the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for the life and service of Liz Carpenter. We pray now for Liz and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May her soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.
As this celebration of my mother's life draws to a close, there are a number of thank yous that we need to give. And uh, first and foremost uh, goes to Lucy Johnson. I uh, was unfortunately too far away when the word came that uh, Liz was fading uh, to make it before she passed. But uh, at four o'clock in the morning, Lucy got up with my sister who had made it here and went to the hospital and the two of them held her hand to say goodbye. And I have to thank her for that. She took my place. I also want to thank the um, LBJ Library and its stellar director, Mark Upgrove, and Deputy Director Tenney Houston, and their entire staff, who have just been absolutely wonderful this week as we plan this event. Um, I also want to thank the wonderful choir from Houston Tillotson College. You guys are just awesome. Obviously, we want to thank the um, speakers who've been here today. I, the eulogies were just wonderful. And uh, we have a few special thanks. There are incredible a number of details when you deal with something Liz Carpenter sort of planned. <laughs> and uh, we had quite a, few, quite a bit of help. Uh, we had a uh, couple of our cousins just gave us their time. Uh, Sarah Marler and Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, we also uh, had incredible help from uh, Joe Sherfy and um, uh, Shirley James. But most importantly, I want to mention two women, one who flew in from California and one who's also from California but drove up from Houston, took off from her law practice, um, uh, Sandra Cuneo and certainly Paula Stout, who really just overwhelmingly did this thing. But the most important thank you is to those of you who've taken the time out of your busy lives to be here uh, and get to, get to honor Liz and to give us, the members of the family, your support during this time. You remind us that while my mother championed great causes from women's rights to environmental beauty to equality of rights for all people, she also touched lives, mentoring hundreds and serving as an example for those who can rise from humble beginnings to the highest power structures in the country. And perhaps her great greatest gift was the gift of joie de vie, the joy of life that she wore openly and proudly. To paraphrase Emile Zola, Liz lived life out loud, whatever she was doing, laughing, singing, politicking. And now we're about to get a chance, we, first of all, we're going to hear the choir again, but before we do, Liz's singing group, the G-Bats, are going to sing one of her favorite songs. Thank you.
marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. Yes, when the saints go marching in. Oh, in the, yeah, when the saints go marching in. Say, when the saints marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in the holy number when the saints go marching in. Yeah, when the saints go marching in. Say, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in the number